Good morning, Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to United Israel World Union. This is our Sabbath morning scripture study coming to you from St. Francisville, Louisiana. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Uh, it's a special day. This very day, the 25th of December, around the world, literally around the world, people are discussing the birth of a deliverer. And so today, on this day, I'm going to join the millions of people around the world and discuss with you the birth of a deliverer. So I wanted to start it off this morning by saying it this way. Now, the birth of this deliverer was in this wise. It's an old King James uh, way of putting it. There was a tyrannical leader who rose to power. And one of his edicts that he put out, this tyrannical leader's edicts, was that all male babies should be killed. Little girls could live, but the boy babies were to be killed. But this one family, there's a plan put in place to protect a child in Egypt from being killed. It proved successful. This particular child grew up and at the appointed time was called by the God of his fathers to a very special task. A task that demanded nothing less than the deliverance of his people. Now, we find in this ancient story also other things of importance, such as that God's firstborn son is in Egypt and will remain in Egypt until the death of this tyrannical leader that I told you about, who sought to kill this deliverer, is dead. Then, after the death of the tyrannical leader, and only then, does the God of heaven call his son out of Egypt? The deliverer's name, the name of God's firstborn son, is given in this most ancient story, which goes back, let's say, 3,500 years. The deliverer's name, at least as we've come to know it, is Moshe. In the name of God's firstborn son that's given in this ancient story is Israel. Welcome to the first class in the book of Exodus. This is an 11-week series that I begin this morning uh, on the 25th of December, normally I don't date the classes because I want them to be evergreen, we call it, where it doesn't matter when you listen to it, but I thought it was so apropos since so many people around the world are talking on this day about the birth of a deliverer and the things that I mentioned. I want the date on this particular class. So today begins an 11-week series, a teaching series within the series we are in class 14 of a larger series, and the larger series, as you know, is called The Pentateuch, A New Look. So we're working through the five books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. We're going through them according to the ancient Jewish reading cycle, uh, the annual reading cycle. And so today is class 14 in that larger series. Today we're going to be examining... Uh, the text, uh, the section of text from Exodus chapter 1 1 all the way through chapter 6 and verse 1. And uh, so I want to give you a couple of intro comments as we get into the material today. The book of Exodus, the very name, the title of the book, comes to us by way of the Greek, uh, at least as we get it from the Septuagint, Exodus means departure. And as you know from a, even a casual reading, you'll, re, you'll realize that the book of Exodus does deal with the departure 
of the children of Israel from Mitzrayim, from the land of Egypt. So it is appropriate to be called by that name. And uh, indeed, like I said, if you just pick up the book of Exodus and you open it up, you're going to see that right away you get into this story uh, leading up to the great departure of the children of Israel from Egypt. Now, the, the stage is set. The stage is set for this story in the book of Exodus, and it was actually set centuries before this by a word that we get in a previous narrative, at least as far as the chronological setting goes. And so the relevant passage that I want to begin with today is not in the book of Exodus, but in the book of Genesis. So if you'll open your Bibles this morning, first thing, to the book of Genesis, and we're going to go to chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15. Today we begin the book of Exodus, but it really, the story begins in chapter 15. Let's read verses 13 and 14. And he, this is God, said unto Avram, Know well that your offspring shall be strangers in a land not theirs, and they shall be enslaved and oppressed four hundred years, but I will execute judgment on the nation they shall serve, and in the end they shall go free with great wealth. That's a key point in today's class. Keep that in mind. Now I want you to get down to verse 16. And they shall return here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, this particular passage, the setting, as you will recall, is a vision where God appears unto Avram. And in this particular vision... You, you've got several things going on, but this particular promise is something dark and foreboding. Avram is actually told of a great struggle and, and a dark time in the history of his descendants. Now remember, at this time, Avram doesn't even have any children. He doesn't have any descendants. But he is told about this dark time that, that his seed will be, the Hebrew says, a ger, a stranger in a land not theirs, and that they will serve the people of the land that they're going to be in this land, and they're going to be uh, afflicted by them for some 400 years. Then ultimately the nation that they serve will be judged, and then after that the seed of Avram will go forth with great possessions. And they'll return to the promised land. And we're told that that is some in the fourth generation. Now, there are differences that people have discussed over when, how long is a generation and so forth. So there are various answers proposed for that. But this then is the beginning of the fulfillment of that vision, at least in terms of the book of Exodus, where we're at in our chronological working through this is the beginning of that getting out. The time has come for Israel uh, to go forth from the land. So now, if you open up to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 1, where we begin our class today, I'm going to talk just a little bit more by way of introduction to the story. Exodus, as, as we have it in English, begins with a list of names, a list of names of the sons of Israel that went to Egypt, right? So if you look at Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each coming with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher. The total number of persons that were of Jacob's issue, came to 70, Joseph already being in Egypt. So what we have here is sort of a recapitulation of the names of the children of Israel. Now, this is not the first time that we encounter the names of the sons of Israel. You'll recall that back in chapter 35, verses 23 through 26, the sons are, are listed. And you can even go back further to Genesis chapter 30, 
where it recounts the birthings of these sons of Israel. And then if you go to, we're not going to do this today, but if you went to chapter 46, uh, verses 8 through 27, you would get a breakdown of the entire family. And if you choose to do this, uh, if you really like getting into the nitty-gritty and the details, you could count you count all the descendants of this son and their children and, and see if you come up with 70. There's a, there's a lot of literature written on this. There are people who uh, dispute the number 70. In fact, we have other ancient texts which give a different number. My class is not going to go into all this today, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. But the Masoretic text, as we have it, uh, comes up with 70. That's the number that the Masoretes, the scribes who solidified the text, and forever and always, after this period of time, according to the Masoretes, this became the reading. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because there are other texts, older texts, which read differently. For instance, the Dead Sea Scrolls, some 1,000 years older than the Masoretic text. The Dead Sea Scroll reading in Hebrew says that there are 75. And the Septuagint, interestingly enough, as often is the case, the Septuagint will align itself with a reading found at Qumran. Now, what that indicates to scholars is that at the time the scrolls were recorded, uh, this was at a time prior, obviously, to the settling of the text. You had variations. Uh, but we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says 75. We find that reading it, uh, aligns with the Septuagint. And, oh, by the way, the Christian Bible, the book of Acts in the Christian Bible, also has 75. So a lot of people will poke fun at, you know, the, the Christian writings and say, look, this is an error. But a lot of times it is aligning with such things as the Septuagint and or a Dead Sea Scroll. That's a different subject altogether. But differences aside in the numbering of the sons of Israel, that's not the main point anyway. It's not so much how many went down into Egypt what the story wants us to focus on is how vast, what a multitudinous group it now has become. That the children of Israel has uh, multiplied to such a place that they are vast in number. In fact, we're told immediately um, that when we open up Exodus, that Joseph and all the brothers, look at verse 6, chapter 1 of Exodus, Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the Israelites were fertile and prolific. They multiplied and increased very greatly so that the land was filled with them. So this image is that the land is totally covered, particularly in that, uh, in that northern uh, that Nile Delta region around the area of Goshen. Look at your Bible maps and you'll see that area. But this place is filled with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it is this proliferation of this foreign group that lives among the people of Egypt that causes a concern for this newly risen king or ruler of the land of Egypt. So he has to set forward and develop a strategy, a strategy by which he can ensure that this multiplying foreign group within his midst doesn't in some future uh, conflict side with potential enemies. Now, one of the things that I like to stress, and I want to make it very clear, is that the children of Israel have been in the land of Egypt their entire life. Everyone who is alive when we begin the book of Exodus, this is all they've known. It's all their parents knew. It's all their grandparents knew. We're talking about several hundred years. And I use this example. If you, uh, in the United States, we have people who come from their, their European extraction. They might be 
Their, their great, great, greats might be from Germany or France or England or Scotland, uh, but they don't know anything about that. The children of Israel, we need to think about them as they are uh, Egyptian for all intents and purposes. This is all they've ever known. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't have stories and customs that they've retained. We have evidences of that in, in modern cultures where people uh, have retained some of that uh, for quite many generations. But what this new king does is this king comes up with a set of strategies, let's call them oppressive measures, that he puts into place to ensure that this proliferation doesn't result in rebellion against this, his, uh, his rule. And the first thing that he puts into place is what is called corvée labor. In other words, it is forced uh, compliance, forced labor, and we see this in a lot of ancient Near East documents uh, but this is what is done is these people are forced into labor and then there is, it, it evolves into more what we would call enslavement, servitude. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I pointed out that it is interesting and should not be ignored that Joseph's plan to save the people the Egyptians, but also the children of Jacob. This plan that he puts in place really results in the enslavement of Egypt. They have ultimately, they've traded everything that was in their possession just to survive. At first, it was just to get the food, and ultimately, they ran out of bartering means, and so they made themselves indentured servants to the throne, if you will, in order to survive. So Joseph, his plan put everybody in Egypt in slavery. And now this new king who rises will return the favor, we might say, and do the same to the sons of Joseph's family. Now, the third thing that he puts in place beyond uh, corvée labor and enslavement is something that is uh, quite criminal. Uh, although only mentioned at the beginning of Exodus, I want to stress this, that nowhere else in the Bible, nowhere else in biblical literature, is it mentioned that this was put into place, which causes some scholars to raise the eyebrow. But it says that this new king puts an edict in place where he, whereby the male children are to be killed. Uh, elsewhere, when these people cry out throughout the rest of the Bible, or uh, particularly in the book of Exodus, uh, for instance, chapter 2, verse 23, chapter 6, verse 6, when the people cry out to God, they don't mention the fact that all the male babies are being killed, which you would think they would mention. What they do mention is this slavery and oppression. This is what they are ultimately crying out about. All right. Now, this particular drastic, cruel crime of infanticide, as we encounter it in the early part of, Gen of uh, Exodus chapter 1, this particular crime is first charged to be carried out by the, mid the midwives. And we're, we're told that the Hebrew midwives are to uh, look at the birthing stool, and if it's a boy, kill it. If it's a girl, let it live. And then if you read on down, the charge is put forward to everyone. In other words, not just the Hebrew midwives, but everyone of the people is enlisted to bring this crime about to actually kill the children. Now, one question that we encounter is concerning these midwives. We're, we're told that they're, they're, they're midwives for these Hebrew women who are giving birth. question is, are they Hebrew or are they Egyptian or foreign? Now, one of the things that we find, at least in our ancient sources, according to the uh, Septuagint 
Josephus, the Jewish sage Abravanel, and many other Jewish sources tell us that these are not Hebrew women, midwives, but they are actually righteous Gentiles. It says that they feared God. When they, they were told, kill the boys, they didn't do it because they feared God. And one, is, one of the things that's interesting is that uh, we actually know two of these Hebrew midwives' names. Now, um, we'll talk about that as we get into the class. But, but this is not, can't be all the midwives if we're talking about the vast numbers, at least that the Bible gives us for the number of the children of Israel. Two people couldn't work full time and keep up with all this. We're talking about, say, the size of the city of Chicago by the time the exodus happens. Now, one of the things that we encounter is that there is a difficulty uh, to come to any real conclusion as to the dating of these events. The first thing that we uh, have to see that is uh, we, we, don't really, we don't really have a lot of internal evidence uh, to go on that gives us an exact date. And then we, we have some things which might throw us off a little bit. Let me clarify that. So we have the names of places that are anachronistic. You remember this term from previous classes. It means that a later author has updated the text. So for instance, it says in the early part of Exodus that the children of Israel built two store cities named Pitom and Ramesses. And Pitom and Ramesses, we know from other data points that these names are much later than what we would suspect in terms of the biblical timing. So Pitom and Ramesses are, say, 12th, 13th century, and, and so, but we, we have another, uh, another internal clue as to the dating of the Exodus that I'm going to go over in just a moment. So uh, when it says that they built these store cities, a lot of you know this, you've studied this, that's the name at a later date of the store cities that they built. So what was the name prior? We're going to get into some of that in another class. But one of the things that I want to do is I want to give you my date, or at least the Bible's date. Let's say it that way. The Bible's date for the Exodus. And we have one really clear clue. Now, there's a lot of debates out there. You can look up the dating of the Exodus, and you'll get everything from the early Bronze Age all the way up through the Iron Age almost. I mean, it is that vast in terms of differences of opinion. The Bible gives us one clue. Go with me, please, to the book of 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 6. And you need this in your notes. If anybody says, what's your date for the Exodus? Do it like I did and say, well, the Bible's date for the Exodus is... Okay, 1 Kings 6.1. In the 480th year after the Israelites left the land of Egypt, in the month of Zeth, and by the way, that's uh, the, the second month, so we're talking about ER on your calendar, if you have a Jewish calendar. That is the second month. In the fourth year of his reign over Israel, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. Now, how is that a clue? Well, if we can determine with any degree of certainty when the fourth year of Solomon's reign was, the beginning of the building of the house of Jehovah, then we ought to have a date that we can just compare and we can take that 480 date and we can go back and figure out when the Exodus was. And we do actually have that uh, on the basis of chronology that we have external to the Bible so if you track what's called the Tyrian king list, uh, the, the kings from Tyre, and uh, uh, that's provided in Josephus, or the Assyrio-Tyrian syn uh, synchronisms, the date for the fourth year of Solomon's reign puts us, you ready for this, at 968 
968 BCE. So if I take 968 BCE and I go back 480 years, because this tells us that 968 plus 480 is going to give us the timing of the Exodus, that gives us a date of 1448 BCE. Now, give or take. Some people might argue 1450 for a round number, but biblically, I just wanted you to have that in your notes because we're going to be going through quite a few things and we want to get as accurately uh, an accurate picture as we can of the time and the circumstances and so forth. Now, the names, as I mentioned, Pitom and Ramesses, throw us off because those come about in the 13th to 12th century BCE. So it's, uh, those names weren't even known when the children of Israel left the land of Egypt. And speaking of names, names are rarely provided in our opening section of the book of Exodus. Now this the fact that they are rarely provided is a point not missed by readers who know that the book of names is the name of the book that lacks the names. Not sure if that made sense. It almost went the way I wanted it. But the idea is that here we have a book in Hebrew. It's known as uh, Exodus from the Greek. But according to the Hebrews, they call the book Shemot. Ve'ele Shemot it begins, and these are the names of the sons of Israel. So in a book that is titled, according to the ancient method of naming a work, uh, based off of the first significant word in the book itself, it's called names, and yet we find ourselves at a loss for the names. So for instance, we don't get a name for the Pharaoh. You would think that this is an important part. Why is the name of the Paro not given? We don't know. We just don't get a name. We, no name is given for the daughter of Pharaoh. And she plays a really significant part in this particular story. We don't know her name. We don't know her father's name. There is no name given initially, in the opening of our story at least, for the Levitical parents. We're told that a certain Levite and uh, his Levite woman bring forth a child. We're not told the name of the Levite parents. Uh, we learn later in the story that the Levite parents have a daughter who's older than the deliverer that's born, we don't get her name either. So it's, I think, that when the scribe put this together, it begins, these are the names of the people that you know, and then you get a new king that doesn't know Joseph, and oh, by the way, there are a lot of other unknowns which follow. It's sort of a method of writing that makes you lean in and think, what do we know? Versus what do we not know? And that's one of the purposes of this teaching series is to draw out, notice my play, if you caught that, to draw out from the story the things that we know. All right. Now, further, when we talk about names in the book of names, we're going to have to get into a lot of this. There are two Hebrew midwives we know that their names, interestingly enough, are Shifra and Pua. We know their names. We know one person in this story, even in the first six chapters, we get three different names for a certain Midianite priest. And he, this Midianite priest, is introduced to us as the father-in-law of our deliverer. We first encounter the father-in-law of our deliverer, this Midianite priest, and, and he's called Ruel. And then we get another meeting with him just a few verses later, and he's called 
Jethro. And then we get another name for him in the same first six chapters, and he's called Jether. Ruel, Jethro, Jether. I'm using the English, the anglicized versions of these names. And, and by the way, elsewhere, we're going to encounter yet another name for our Midianite priest. Now, we do learn the name of our deliverer. But that name, Moshe, comes to us by way of a, what the scribe is using here is sort of a, a, a Hebrew folk etymology. Folk etymology. And, and what he's doing, or she, whoever the scribe may be, who writes this story for us, when the story is told, the story is presented as if the name Moshe has a Hebrew uh, background, that it's, that it's a Hebrew word. And, uh, and so that could very well be the case, you know, because we'll talk about that. But also I want to point out that there is uh, another view of the name, another meaning of the name that comes to us from the Egyptian. So is it meant for us to see that the name means one thing in Hebrew and another thing in Egyptian? I think that could very well be the case. But again, we want to draw out, you see that, draw out the true meaning of these things as we work through the text. Now, we also get some other names that we know. We learn the name of the deliverer's wife or woman. Her name is Sipora. Sipporah. Uh, one of the two sons of Sipporah and Moshe we get. The name is Gershom. We get uh, the name of a brother of Moses this week, whose name is Aharon, uh, Aaron. And we also learn, and this is very interesting because not only this week, but next week's class, we're going to talk about something that we learn for the first time in this week's class. We learn with Moses, with Moses, we learn the name or a name for the God of the fathers, all right, which later in Exodus, next week's class, we're going to read that that name wasn't known until the time of Moses. So we'll have to get into that uh, with a lot of focus. And we learn the name that is associated with the exalted title of God's son, his firstborn, Israel. Open your Bibles with me this morning to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, and I want to read Exodus 2, verses 1 through 10. A certain man of the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. And the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw how beautiful he was, or goodly as the Hebrew puts it, she hid him for three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she got a wicker basket for him, caulked it with bitumen and pitch, she put the child into it and placed it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. And his sister stationed herself at a distance to learn what would befall him. So you, we're picking up the clues that I, rough, that I touched on. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the Nile while her maidens walked along the Nile. She spied the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to fetch it. When she opened it, she saw it was a child, a boy, crying. She took pity on him and said, this must be a Hebrew child. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get a Hebrew nurse to suckle the child for you? And Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter answered, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will pay your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and made him her son. She named him Moses, explaining, I drew him out of the water. I drew him out of the water. 
Now, the first thing that I want to point out is that uh, you should notice what I touched on about the unnamed characters. You, you, don't, you don't get the names, the first name that we encounter in this particular text, as if the writer wants to draw your eyes. I'm going to use the word draw a few times, so just you should, I don't want to stomp my foot and make it that obvious, but if you hear draw, drew, you, you're going to get the picture. But, but what, I, what the writer wants you to draw your attention to the name of this deliverer. Now, like the deliverer Noah, we know uh, the deliverer named Noah, who in the chapters of Genesis, chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9, this new deliverer, like Noah, is associated with the Hebrew word teva, which is translated ark. So as Noah comes in and brings in, if you will, a covenant, and, and he is a deliverer, so too our next deliverer in our story, Moshe. He too is associated with the teva. And by the way, that's the only two times that the Hebrew uses teva. It's uh, the story of Noah in Genesis 6, 7, 8, uh, and 9. Uh, and then two times of the basket, it's translated basket or something like that in the, the Moses story. So you have 25 times in the Bible and two times uh, dealing with Moses. So an unnamed mother puts a child in to a basket. She slips it into the river. An unnamed sister keeps watch to see what's going to happen. Uh, an unnamed daughter of an unnamed Pharaoh notices, recognizes that the child is a Hebrew child. The unnamed sister of the yet-to-be-named baby offers to get a wet nurse of the Hebrew woman or from the Hebrew women, I should say. Now, this I find very interesting. A lot of people miss this part. So the baby, remember the edict is that the children will be cast into the river. And the language is very similar to what she does. She does put the baby forth in the river. The idea a lot of commentators suggest that these boy babies would be put into the river, perhaps in baskets, and that whatever happened to them happened to them. Now, the difference is that this child, this deliverer, now we don't know, by the way, what his Hebrew name is. We don't know. I like to think about what did his mother uh, call him as she held him as a baby? Is there another name, or has tradition pulled that name forward for us? Was it Moses? Did the mother call him Moses? We don't know. Uh, but the idea is that this child is put forward into the water, and, and ultimately his own mother raises him. Now, a lot of people think that she nurses him for a couple of years and then sends him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she raises him his whole life and puts him through good public schools in Cairo, uh, you know, and he, he learns all the secret arts of the Egyptians. That's what a lot of people uh, have proposed. But I want to tell you that we don't see that in the text. That's not in the Bible. What we see is that where it says, and after the child is grown or he gets bigger or he gets older, however it's translated in your English Bible, the Hebrew says, uh, when he was big. Now, I mean, does that mean that he's, uh, he's kind of a small child or does it mean when he grew up? Vaigdol. So Vaigdo, he stays with his mother, and then Vaigdo, I don't know. It, we just don't have that data. We don't have an age. Uh, it doesn't say that 
you know, she gets him to a certain point and he's still a baby. But the idea is that when he's big, he goes to the court of Pharaoh. Now, look at verse 10 again of chapter 2. <clears throat> when the child grew up, this is a, uh, JPS, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter who made him her son. And she named him Moshe, explaining, I drew him out of the water. Now, that, that doesn't connect for us in English. I want to share with you that the, there is a Hebrew play that's common when we deal with etiology of names. What's the origin of a name? So in Hebrew, it says, Vatikrashimo Moshe, and she called his name Moshe because... From the water, Meshitihu. You hear the Moshe and the Meshi. It's a play on words. Now, this works in English. If I were writing an English Bible uh, and I wanted to make this point come across in English, I learned this from Richard Elliott Friedman. He's the Hebrew Bible scholar. This is what he teaches his students. He says this, that if you... Uh, if you want this to make sense in English, you would say, she called his name Drew because she said, I drew him from the water. See, the word is connected uh, and it means something in English. So in the Hebrew, called his name Moshe, for he, uh, Meshitihu, those are connected. Now, there's an Egyptian connection as well. The Egyptian connection, I think, is quite fascinating. <clears throat> In Egyptian, you, there is a, what well, I'm just going to call it sort of a root word, a base word, that is represented as either the M sound and the S sound or the MSS sound. So, for instance... If I want to tell you about an Egyptian named Tutmose, have you ever heard of Tutmos? It's actually pronounced Tutmose. Tutmose means born of Tut or the son of Tut. Tutmose, you say, well, who, who is that? Oh, that's the son of Tut. Tutmose. Uh, is the born the one born of Tut, and that could be uh, sort of a divine name, Tut, uh, or it could be the person's father, right? What about Ramesses? We talked about Ramesses being an anachronistic name of a place that's inserted into the early Exodus chapters. But Ramesses means Ra, Mesis, Mesis means born of or the child of Ra. The son of Ra, the child of Ra. So when you say in Egyptian, when you say Mose, it, it means born of who? It, it's a blank. It's like saying the child of or born of, we don't know. It's unknown. It's a big question mark which would make sense if you find a child in a basket. They don't know who his father is. Now, verse 11 continues. Sometime after that, there's no break in the Hebrew. And it was in those days, I'm using my translation here, when Moses had grown up that he went forth to his brothers and he saw their burdens and he saw an Egyptian man uh, smiting a Hebrew man from his brothers. And verse 12 says that he smote this Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, this raises all sorts of questions. It, it's Now, by the way, it's the same word there when he grew up as we find in verse 10, when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. 
What is grown up? I don't know. But whatever grown up is there, the next verse says sometime after that, when Moses had grown up, it's giving you a, a point of reference. He's also grown up in this particular story. What we don't know is that he, he, when it says he went forth to his brothers, how does he know who his brothers are? Well, is he raised uh, among his people? As, as we can maybe get from the text here? Uh, or is it like um, uh, Cecil DeMille has it, where he's told by someone in the Egyptian court, you know, and he later learns he doesn't know anything about his heritage and learns later? That's not the impression that I get, but uh, that's the impression of others, I guess. Now look at verse 13. When he went out the next day, he found two Hebrews fighting, and so he said to the offender, Why do you strike your fellow? And he retorted, Who made you chief and ruler of, uh, over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Moses was frightened and thought, Then the matter is known. And when Pharaoh learned of the matter, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh. And he arrived in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. What we get from this, we're only given glimpses, so we have to make use of the data points as we're given them. We see that Moses uh, is a defender of people. We see that he defends a, a, a Hebrew who's being beaten by an Egyptian. And then he sees two Hebrews, so it's not, it's not a racial thing. He's not just protecting his own people. He, he, if he sees someone in trouble, the, the scribe wants us to know, these ancient sources tell us, that Moses was the guy who would step in. That's the image we get. Now, we, we see this later as well. Look at verse 16. Uh, now, the priest of Midian, Exodus 2.16, had seven daughters. And they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock, but shepherds came and drove them off. Moses rose to their defense and he watered their flock. And when they returned to their father, Ruel, first name of his father in law, he said, How is it that you've come back so soon today? And they answered, An Egyptian. Notice he looks Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. There's Drew again. He said to his daughters, where is he then? Why did you leave the man? Ask him in to break bread. Moses consented to stay with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah as wife. And she bore him a son whom he named Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Now, by the way, you realize that that is only... Uh, three verses, and we've covered quite a bit of time there. From the time that he defends the girls until he has a baby, right? So that that's just what it's telling us is we don't have a lot. What we do have are these snapshots, these ancient stories that are pulled together uh, to give us a picture that emerges with careful look. All right. Now, uh, I, I just want to stress that when these girls, the seven daughters of the Midianite priest, who we now know as Ruel, when, whenever they see him, they don't say a Hebrew uh, saved uh, us. They say an Egyptian. He must look to them like an Egyptian. Okay. Uh, look at um, let's see, verse 23, <clears throat> a long time after that, the king of Egypt died. <clears throat> the Israelites were groaning under the bondage and cried out, <clears throat> and their cry for help from bondage rose up to God. God heard their moaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and God looked upon the Israelites and God took note. This brings us 
into one of the most fascinating passages in all of Hebrew Scripture. And it's called the story of the bush. And I want to read in its entirety and then go through it. And I can do this in pretty short order. Chapter 3, Exodus, verse 1. Now Moses, tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, there's another name for our father-in-law, the priest of Midian drove the flock into the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire out of a bush. He gazed, and there was a bush all aflame, yet the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I must turn aside to look at this marvelous sight. Why doesn't the bush burn up? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he answered, Hineni, here am I. And he said, don't come closer, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. I am, he said, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have marked well the plight of my people in Egypt, and have heeded their outcry because of their taskmasters. Yes, I am mindful of their sufferings. I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the region of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. Moreover, I have seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, therefore, and I will send you to Paro, Pharaoh, and you shall free my people, the Israelites, from Egypt. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and free the Israelites from Egypt? And he said, I'll be with you, and that shall be a sign that it was I who sent you. And when you have freed the people from Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Moses said to God, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, Ehie, Asher, Ehie. He continued, thus you shall say to the Israelites, Ehie sent me to you. And God said further to Moses, thus you shall speak to the Israelites, Jehovah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This shall be my name forever, this my appellation for all eternity. Go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, Jehovah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me and said, I've taken note of you and what is being done to you in Egypt, and I have declared, I will take you out of the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. They'll listen to you. Then you shall go with the elders of Israel to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, Jehovah, the God of the Hebrews, manifested himself to us. Now therefore, let us go a distance of three days into the wilderness to sacrifice to Jehovah our God. Yet I know that the king of Egypt will let you go, um, uh, only because of a greater might. So I'll stretch out my hand, smite Egypt with various wonders which I will work upon them. After that, he will let you go, and I will dispose the Egyptians favorably toward this people so that when you go, you will not go away empty-handed. Each woman shall borrow from her neighbor and the lodger in her house of objects of silver and gold and clothing. You shall put these on your sons and daughters, thus stripping the Egyptians. Okay. I wanted to cover that entire section. Horeb, we learn, is the place of this encounter. Horeb. It's called Horeb. Uh, it, we learn that it's on, according to the text, it's on the west side or the far side of the Midbar, the wilderness. I'm going to go through some ideas here I want you to think about because we have to figure out where is Horeb? Is it in modern-day Saudi Arabia, as the populist would put forward in movies and all these cool things that you see on, uh, uh, I don't know, Patterns of Evidence and all these other shows? And it's very, very popular right now. Is that where it's at? All right. Well, we're going we're gonna to follow the clues. The mountain of God is called Har Ha Elohim. It's known by this particular 
uh, title or this particular description. Only in the book of Exodus, Horev is associated with Har Ha Elohim. The phrase Har Ha Elohim only occurs in Exodus and one place in 1 Kings, and that's uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 8. And why do we know it there? Because Eliyahu, Elijah, is fleeing from the wicked Jezebel, and he goes uh, on this long journey, and he goes to Horev, and there it is called Har Ha Elohim. Now, one of the things I want to point out is that this place, Horeb, is called the mountain of God, Har Ha Elohim, before there's a giving of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. So it's not the mountain of God because God was there at Sinai at Horeb and gave the Ten Commandments. It's already known as the mountain of God. All right, we're going to be following sources and looking at vocabulary and words and phrases that clue us in. So just a question that you ought to have in your notes. Why is Har Ha Elohim only used in Exodus and 1 Kings? Why isn't it called Har Ha Elohim in Deuteronomy? Just a question. Now, the other thing I want to draw your attention to is that when... This encounter happens at the bush. There's a switching back and forth, a mysterious switching. In chapter 3, verse 2, it says that the Malach Jehovah, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of Yahweh, however you translate that, Malach yod yod heh vav heh, is in the bush. And then in verse 4, it's Jehovah, it says, that's in the bush. And then later in the same verse 4, it says it's Elohim. So is Malach Yehovah, also Yehovah, also Elohim? Verse 6, he says, I am the God of your father, singular. And then he lists Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Just bringing up some of these points. In chapter uh, 3, verses 7 through 10, God has taken note of the, the, the oppression of the Israelites, and he selected Moses. Now, does he select Moses because he sees Moses as a defender of the uh, the downtrodden? Could be. The scribe certainly wants us to know this, makes a very strong point of this. And then Moses goes into a series of reasons uh, to refuse the offer, to refuse the job. He, sa- he starts by saying, uh, who am I? Now, God doesn't answer who he is. What God says is, I will be with you. And in a way, that is the answer. Doesn't matter who you are if God's with you. And that works for us too. Doesn't matter who you are, who I am. Uh, God says, uh, and I will be imach with, uh, imach with you. And he, he noticed it says in verse 12, You will serve God on this mountain, translated sometimes worship. In verse 13, what's your name? He says, Ehie Asher Ehie. Uh, Typically, that's translated, I will be whatever I will be. I know it's popular to translate it, I am what I am, but it's, it's really better translated, I will be whatever I will be. Now, that's not very specific. That's not like he's giving him a name. He asked for a name. He just tells him, I'll be whatever I'll be. But then he says, getting more specific, he says, uh, Ehie, tell the children of Israel, Ehie sent me to you. Now, we're going to get into next week whether or not the children of Israel know anything about this name that is about to be revealed. In verse 15, he says that the name Jehovah, this is my name forever unto all generations. And we assume then that that's God's name as far back as time goes and as far forward. Uh, But at least according to one source, that is not the case. The name was not known until the time of Moses, but that's next week. We're going to really get into that because I know people have questions about it. So he's at, he's at Horeb. This is where this encounter takes place. 
He tells him, you're going to gather the elders, go back to Egypt. You're going to gather the elders. You're going to fill them in on everything that I've told you. And then you and the elders are going to go to Pharaoh. And he he says, here's what you're going to tell Pharaoh. You're going to tell Pharaoh, let us go three days into the wilderness. Now, I have a question for you. Where is their destination? Their destination, we already read this. The destination is not just some random place in the wilderness where they can find a campground on the side of the road. Their their destination is Horeb. So he says, you're going to tell, you're going to come back to this mountain. This is where you're coming. And when you're talking to Pharaoh, you're going to say, we need to go three days journey. Now, this could this be a clue? Here, here's the reason I bring it up. In chapter 3, verse 18, in chapter 5, verse 3, and chapter 8, verse 23, Moses uh, mentions this three-day journey that they want to take, the children of Israel. We need a three-day journey. Now, where is the three-day journey going to put them? Does this give us in any way an idea of how far it is from the place of departure uh, to Horeb? Now, you might say, well, it takes them longer than three days. Of course it does. In antiquity, you measure a distance based on the number of days it would typically take to travel. Now, if you have extenuating circumstances such as, uh, you know, 603,550 males plus women, children, goats, all the animals that you're going to bring, you can expect that it's going to take longer. But it's still a three-day journey. That's the way that, that distance was reckoned. Now, in, thir- in verse 21, it says that they're not going to go out empty-handed. You'll recall that in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, look at that one more time. Genesis 15, 13, it says this. Um, uh, know that your, your people are going to be strangers and so forth. Verse 14, but I will execute judgment on the nations they sh- the nation they will serve, and in the end they will go out with great wealth. So the idea is that you're not going to go out empty-handed. Well, that's because it was promised to Abraham that that was to be the case. And chapter 4, the reasons to refuse this assignment continue. Moses begins chapter 4 by saying, uh, they're not going to believe me. So God gives him some signs, some miracles to perform in order to convince those to who he appears that everything that he's saying is true. Now look at chapter 4, Exodus 4, and verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, to Jehovah, Please, O Lord, I have never been a man of words, either in times past or now that you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now what does that mean? Kaved Lashon, heavy tongue. Does it mean he has a speech impediment? I've heard people teach that. Um, Kaved Lashon, the heavy tongue. Well, we have one other place in Scripture that might give us a clue. Go with me to Ezekiel. <clears throat> Ezekiel. Again, I try to make sense of the Bible based on the Bible's own words. Uh, rather than impose my random thoughts on the text. Ezekiel 3 and verse 5. Let's start in verse 4. Ezekiel 3, 4. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and repeat my very words to them. For you are sent not to a people of unintelligible speech and difficult language, but to the house of Israel not to the many people of unintelligible speech and difficult language whose talk you cannot understand. If I sent you to them, they would listen to you. He goes on and he says, but I'm sending you to the people of Israel. They understand this. The idea that's conveyed here in the Hebrew, it uses the same language. Kaved 
lashon, a heavy tongue. I'm not sending you to somebody with a heavy tongue, but people who do understand you, they just don't listen, right? So what it means to say, it could be very likely, it's the only other occurrence really of this kaved lashon, it could be saying, let me ask it this way, does Moses excuse himself by suggesting that he doesn't speak the language of the people? Could it be? Could he be saying that his kaved lashon is an inability to communicate to the people of Israel or his difficulty in doing it? I'll leave that for you to consider. Now, in Exodus chapter 4, go back to Exodus 4 and look at uh, verse 13. <clears throat> but he said, this is Moses, Please, O Lord, make someone else your agent. The Lord became angry with Moses, and he said, There is your brother Aaron the Levite. Now I want you to think about, it. does Moses look around him? Now first of all, Moses is where? Is it Horeb? Now we don't know where Horeb is. Presumably, though, Aaron must. There is your brother Aaron the Levite. He, I know, speaks readily. Even now he is setting out to meet you, and he will be happy to see you. You shall speak to him uh, and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with you and with him as you speak and tell both of you what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, Thus he shall serve as your prophet or your spokesman with you playing the role of God to him. Now I'm reading JPS. And take with you this rod which you will perform the sign. So he tells him, look, I don't think that he means to imply by this text, even though the English sounds like it, hey, look, there's Aaron coming right there. What he does tell him, though, is Aaron, your brother the Levite, is headed this way. And when he gets here, he's going to be your prophet, and you're going to be for him, in Hebrew it says, Lelohim, for God. So this translation makes it like a role play, which is somewhat true. You, Moses is going to hear from God. This is the way it's going to work. Moses is going to hear from God, and he's going to tell, because he's got Kaved Leshon, he's going to tell Aaron what to say, and then Aaron is going to give the people the message. So Moses is going to be Lelohim for God. Aaron is going to be uh, Le Navi for a prophet. Now, how does Aaron, we don't even know Aaron at this point. It's the first time we've heard of your brother Aaron the Levite. We don't even know him. And he here we're told that he's coming to you. So not only the question, one question is, how is Aaron going to find Moses at Horeb? And even more importantly is, how does he know where Horeb is? It's a big wilderness. Aaron, uh, let, me, let me show you one more. I just thought of this. Look at chapter 7, verse 1 of Exodus. This is next week's class. But uh, the Lord replied to Moses, See, I place you in the role of God to Pharaoh, with your brother Aaron as your prophet. So that kind of underscores what we read in 4.16. Um, now, chapter 4, verse 18. Now this is after God tells Moses, you're going to do it. Aaron's going to be your prophet. Moses goes back, verse 18, to his father-in-law, Jether. Not Ruel, not Jethro. Now we call him Jether. And said to him, let me go back to my kinsmen in Egypt and see how they are faring. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who sought to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, plural, 
mounted them on an ass and went back to the land of Egypt and Moses took the rod of God with him. Now, in verse 18, Moses requests to go back to his brothers in Egypt. In 20, verse 20, it says that he heads out with his two sons. Now, the last we heard, Moses has one son named Gershom. So obviously by this point, he's got a second son. We don't know his name yet, okay? We've only been introduced to Gershom. So it's Gershom and child two are going to go back uh, to, the land of, uh, is, to the land of Egypt. Verse 21, And the Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the marvels that I put within your power. I, however, will stiffen or strengthen his heart so that he will not let the people go. And you shall say this to Pharaoh, Thus says Jehovah, in Hebrew, Koamar Yehovah, Israel is my firstborn son. I have said to you, let my son go that he may worship me, yet you refuse to let him go. Now I will slay your firstborn son. Israel is called God's firstborn son. Remember in Hosea chapter 11, out of Egypt I called my son? If you look at that verse, it says Israel is my firstborn. Israel's my son. Out of Egypt I called my son. Hosea 11 is talking about Israel. It's talking about this exodus, which we are talking about here. Moses is told, you go tell Pharaoh that Israel is my firstborn son. And you know, as far as we know, Moses never told those words to Pharaoh. He's supposed to start it with Koamar Yehovah, thus says Jehovah. Now this phrase, I just want to bring this up. This is the first of 291 occurrences of the Hebrew phrase, thus says Jehovah. 291, this is the first time it occurs in the Bible. In the five books of uh, the Pentateuch, it only occurs in Exodus, and it's ten times in Exodus. So Koamar Yehovah doesn't appear in Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy, only Exodus, and we'll talk about why that is at another point. Look at verse 27. The Lord said to Aaron, this is, by the way, this is right after when you go back, um, I want you to tell Pharaoh. All right, look at verse 27. The Lord Jehovah said to Aaron, go to meet Moses in the wilderness. And he went and met him at the mountain of God, Har Ha Elohim, and he kissed him. Moses told Aaron all about the things that Jehovah had commanded to him and all the signs about which he had instructed him. Then Moses and Aaron went to the, and assembled all the elders of the Israelites. And Aaron repeated all the words that Jehovah had spoken to Moses. And he, Aaron, performed the signs in the sight of the people. And the people were convinced when they heard that Jehovah had taken note of the Israelites and that he had seen their plight, they bowed low in homage. Now remember in chapter 4, verse 14 through 16, God tells Moses, there's Aaron, your brother, the Levite. He's now preparing to come see you. And I ask, how does he know where Horeb is? And there's all these mentions of three days journey. And then just a little while later in the text, Aaron, who we assume must have been in Egypt, gets out of Egypt and meets Moses at Horeb. You see that? Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Is Horeb in modern-day Saudi Arabia? You think he's made it from the Nile Delta to meet up with uh, Moses in, you know, did he have to cross the sea to get to him? So we have all these questions. I mean, they didn't have um, the airlines at the time where he could fly. I mean, he's, he's hoofing it. 
Then they're told to go gather the elders. Now, you know that's got to happen in Egypt. So from the time that they meet up at Horeb, wherever that is, not Saudi Arabia, they go to Egypt where they gather up the Israelites. In verse 30, it says that Aaron does a talking. Well, that's what we just heard was going to happen. God's going to tell Moses, Moses tells Aaron, Aaron tells the people. Now, chapter 5, and I'm wrapping up, chapter 5 is the first encounter with Pharaoh. Look at verse 1 through 3. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says Jehovah, the God of Israel, me, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is Jehovah? Who is Jehovah that I should listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know Jehovah, nor will I let Israel go. And they answered, the God of the Hebrews has manifested himself to us. Let us go, we pray, a distance of three days into the wilderness. A couple of questions. They want to celebrate a hag, a festival in the wilderness. And I ask you, what festival do you think they're celebrating? Why do they need to go to the wilderness, a three days journey, to celebrate a hag, a festival? And what festival are they going to keep? And, and why is it, tell me this, why is it that Pharaoh has never even heard Jehovah? And what about this three day journey? Now, this little first encounter that Moses and Aaron have with the Egyptian court of Pharaoh turns out to make matters worse. They have several subsequent meetings, but, but after this first one, they, you, not only do you have to go get straw, uh, not only do you have to make bricks with mud and straw, we're not getting the, the straw for you anymore. You have to go get your own raw materials and bring them to the work site. And by the way, you can't let any of your work uh, quota diminish. So there's several subsequent meetings. The deliverers, Moses and Aaron, the team, Moses and Aaron, have their work cut out for them. In the coming weeks, we will finally have some, but not all, of the missing names to plug into our book of names study. And we will next week face a mystery concerning the name of God communicated to Moses at Horeb. Specifically, when I talk about the mystery, why has Pharaoh never heard of it? And furthermore, who among the people of Israel knew it and when? But that is next week as we continue our journey to look at an ancient author or the ancient authors of the book Name Names are going to tell us more and more about the Exodus. Shabbat Shalom, Shavua Tov. Have a beautiful week. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful weekend with family and friends and uh, many blessings. <music>